I welcome you all to our first VBU, what the Virtual Bariatric University, episode one, an initiative from Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics. Uh, so it has always been our endeavor to spread knowledge and share skills, and in turn, we end up learning much more. So after having performed more than fourteen thousand procedures, we thought we are duty bound to share our experiences with the world. I would like to introduce our stellar group of faculties we have with us today. So I would first like to introduce Professor Wendy Brown. Uh, Professor Wendy Brown is uh, hi. <laughs> Professor Wendy Brown is the director of the Center for Obesity Surgery and Education and clinical lead for the National Bariatric Surgery Registry. She was the first woman to be appointed the chair of Monash University Department of Surgery in 2015. Professor Brown's area of expertise includes bariatric and upper gastrointestinal surgeries, including cancer and reflux diseases. She is the president elect of Australia and New Zealand's Gastroesophageal Surgery Association, and immediate past president of the Obesity Surgery Society of Australia and New Zealand. So I welcome Professor Wendy Brown. Thank you very much. Our second panelist is Dr. Manish Khetan. Hi. Hi. So Dr Manish Khetan is the president of Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of India. He is the director of No Obesity Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Center. Dr Khetan has 15 plus years of experience in bariatric and metabolic surgery and 20 plus years of experience in other gastro and minimal invasive surgeries. So I welcome Dr Manish Khetan and I'm thanking both of you for uh, agreeing to participate in our course. Thank you so much. The next faculty is obviously uh, includes Dr. Mathias Fobi, the man who needs no introduction. First, I would like to wish him a very happy birthday. Uh, today is his birthday. Thank you. So he's uh, he's the and we are honored to have him as our director. At uh, we are honored to have him as our director uh, at our center. He's the director of clinical affairs. So I welcome Dr. Fobi, and uh, the uh, operating surgeon will be Dr. Mohit Bandari. who is the founder director and chief surgeon of mohak bariatrics and robotics so now uh, we'll be starting our virtual bariatric meeting the first i welcome dr fobi to start with the first lecture you can share uh, i'm ready to share but you say you've disabled it too much okay just i'm making you the host okay now you can share all right There we go. Mm -hmm. Good day, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are across the continent. It is my pleasure. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. And you see my projection clearly? Yeah. All right, thank you all very much. I would like to welcome our panelists, Dr. Wendy Brown and uh, Dr. Manish Katen and the audience. Um this is a course on intraoperative endoscopy and my introductory lecture is going to talk about preoperative endoscopy before bariatric operation. It's a hot topic at this time in metabolic surgery. Uh, I see for some reason um uh, can I give you the virtual report right now sir yeah i am not let's see hello i'm having a block it for advancing the slide no 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 i didn't block it so just uh, click on the arrow please on the screen here no that's right Sir, you have all the controls. We don't have. A, I don't have any control. All right. Should I put desktop share? Yes. Uh, we can see your presentation. Yeah, but for some reason, there is a uh, uh, in, in left corner. You will see the arrows. So you have to click on that arrow. All right. The one down here. Yes. yes. Is that it? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Thank you. Greetings from Sames and Mohawk. and uh for my own personal disclosure i had a gastric bypass uh for diabetes and i'm doing well 
this is the case uh, mixture from Mohawk, as Isha has required us to disclose this when we do it. At Mohawk, we've done almost 14,000 cases to date. We do a variety of cases. And this is my famous quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I look only to the good qualities of men. Not being faulted myself, I wouldn't presume to probe into the faults of others. I try to live by that. But let me go to the core of the lecture. Bariatric and metabolic procedure alter the gastric. I'm really sorry. I think uh, Dr. Phoebe has some uh, issues. He just got disconnected. So I would like now, now like to invite Dr. Bhandari. So he'll just uh, continue what Dr. Phoebe was, I think, about to say. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Mohit. How are you? How are you, Wendy and Dr. Manish? Thank you very much for joining us. I think Dr. Phoebe lost some communication. You know, at, at his age, he's trying to catch up with the technology. So no, no, I think he's techno savvy, and it is his birthday, so spare him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll I have his presentation. So I'll in the meantime. So the plan is that I'll share his presentation, and then uh, we we go to the operating room live where I perform and intraoperative endoscopy with the procedure so that we understand what are the challenges which I'm going to face. And then from there on, we go forward and uh, have the data from the Mohawk to have your comments uh, so that we can discuss about uh, why we are doing this. So just for all those viewers who have joined, uh, this particular uh, uh, presentation is probably by Dr. Phoebe was to explain uh, a different concept than what is being done across the world. So we all know uh, for different reasons that most of the centers would do a preoperative endoscopy. And uh, this preoperative endoscopy would be done either by a gastroenterologist or by a surgeon at his uh, particular center. Uh, and that, uh, that case being said, then they would discuss these endoscopic findings with the uh, patient and then they would decide upon the procedure. Whereas what we do at Mohawk is something very different and very unique. Uh, we usually do uh, uh, the procedures of endoscopy intraoperatively and uh, these procedures uh, having been done intraoperatively, we have to take a blanket consent uh, that uh, uh, the patient might have a different procedure uh, being done uh, uh, from our center uh, that if suppose we have committed him a sleeve at our center, just depending upon the intraoperative findings, we might change the procedure at that particular stage. So let me take you through this presentation first. So this is a report from our center. Uh, we bring greetings. These are my disclosures. Uh, these are our case disclosures. But the most important part, what I wanted to discuss is that why preoperative endoscopy is required in the very first place, or why any endoscopy is required before we touch upon the uh, gastrointestinal anatomy. So we know that upper digestive diseases are at least two to three more times uh, more times commoner in the morbidly obese patients. And that's probably the reason uh, why uh, we would very frequently find findings like esophagitis, gastritis, hiatus hernia, and several others in the morbidly obese patients. Also, it has been well published that uh, the routine uh, Endoscopy before bariatric surgery in specifically in asymptomatic patients is still controversial. So there would be some centers who would not do it, would not recommend it because most patients would be, would be asymptomatic and still have findings. And some patients who are symptomatic will not have any findings. So uh, the issue is with the asymptomatic patients who would report to us without any findings. And that's why uh, uh, there still is not a well-established path uh, about preoperative bariatric endoscopy. Uh, hiatus hernia and reflux esophagitis are relative contraindications to sleeve, but again, we can admit it to the extent that most surgeons would repair the hiatus with a sleeve and the controversy goes on, and there is no consensus between the surgeons. The preoperative endoscopy may result in alteration of surgical approach or maybe a delay in surgery in 1 to 9% of these patients. So that's uh, something which we all have to think that what is the alteration which is going to happen if, if, if all of us are doing an endoscopy, what alteration we're going to have, what sort of findings we're going to face, which would change the entire course of our procedure. Uh, now, uh, if we see uh, uh, the uh, in 
importance of or the significance of what we do at mohawk so we are doing intraoperative endoscopy instead of doing preoperative endoscopies or or endoscopies being done by somebody outside our center so what is the advantage now this radical approach has the advantage of having minimal amount of discomfort to our patients it's a one time anesthesia so you need not have you know patient given sedation outside and then he comes again and have another anesthesia it's very less time consuming for both the patient and the doctor the cost specifically is a constraint in india and that that gets reduced uh, very drastically uh, also we have uh, experienced that we have a very decreased uh, dropout rate at our center so for example i have i have had patients who had pre operative endoscopy like 8 8 years back when we were not following this protocol they shy away from surgery they either get threatened or they get afraid and then they don't turn up Uh, they they feel as if you know uh, doing an endoscopy in sedation was very uncomfortable experience very unpleasant experience for them so that's something which we uh, you know uh, thought that maybe we uh, uh, we have to principally change our approach and do something which is very different than what we are doing now so uh, 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 we decided to do intraoperative endoscopy and not preoperative and take a blanket consent from the patients that although based on your profile we have decided this procedure but if there is something which we find inside which is very different from what we feel we will change the uh, procedure and that can happen from 1 to 10% of the patients so that's that's a blanket consent uh, you know this is not only endoscopy but i have dr manish khatan is there wendy can comment and i i see that there are a lot of other surgeons joining us we have this we put in a scope and we see a cirrhotic liver but there was nothing reported on the ultrasound so we have to change from a bypass to a sleeve uh, similarly we go inside and there is a obstructed hernia there and the bowel is stuck in the hernia so we don't touch the bowel so even though if we committed to a gastric bypass we would go and do a sleeve so it's not only endoscopy but routinely you know there are certain situations where we have to change the procedure we decided same is with intraoperative endoscopy uh, now when i share my data it is very interesting you would realize how and why i did this and what are my results so then we can compare and you can criticize or we you can suggest us the way ahead this is just what we realized uh, during our 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 center what we did our center now if we see what was the aim of this data which i am presenting the study uh that to determine the feasibility safety and effectiveness of intraoperative pre bariatric surgery endoscopy the first aim the second was to determine the incidence of pathological findings we find before just before the surgery on the table before the patient undergo bariatric surgery and then the interesting part was to correlate these symptoms with the endoscopic findings and maybe to determine the incidence of patients whose planned surgery was altered because of this approach so very interesting approach everything is decided on the table patient is being asked to give a blanket consent that the procedure might change inside on the table depending upon the endoscopic findings and the wisdom of the surgeon so that's what is happening this is a prospective interventional study started on march 2018 and we collected data we are still collecting it but i am presenting the data till until february february 28 2020 we did routine intraoperative endoscopy in 1948 patients which is 1900 patient is a huge data the patients were consented for endoscopy and the possibility of altering the choice of operation was discussed with the patient the alternative options were also consented by the patient so this is this is all which we which we took ethical clearance for we discussed with the patient that we have to alter your your procedure depending on the endoscopic findings which will be present inside now you see these are 1948 patients we had to remove 86 patients whom we consented for that but we were not able to do it there were some patients who had single incision surgery so they we did not do the endoscopy some patients who had hepatitis hiv positive were removed so this these 86 patients are not the part of the study out of 1948 there was one unsuccessful attempt where we could not do an endoscopy the scope was not not getting negotiated although this patient did not had an had a pathology and there was one patient with a very very large hiatus where you know the scope just got lost and we could not negotiate uh 10% were done by bariatric surgical consultants like myself or dr phobi and 90% was done by our surgical fellows so this is this is what happened here if you see this this uh, age age was around 44 years on an average 
53% uh, of our patients were females, uh, around uh, the rest were males. The, the, the weight and the BMI, so 117 kilos was the average weight in this group and 44 was the average BMI in this group. Now this is interesting. The findings which were there in patients who were symptomatic, so these were patients who had symptoms uh, out of the 1,000, 1,900 some patients we, we did. Out of them, 24% of our patient uh, uh, had some findings, which means that if, if out, out of the 1,900 some patients, 350 patients were symptomatic, only 84 of them uh, were having findings. So this proves that if you have patients who are symptomatic, not all are going to have findings on the endoscopy. And this all of us know. So just 24%. Another interesting thing, asymptomatic patients, which means preoperatively, we never had a chance uh, of, of detecting as part of the symptoms of the patient in them as per the history. But again, 25% of, of them, that is 351 out of 1377 patients, again, had some findings. So you can see that 25% of asymptomatic patients will have finding and another 24% of symptomatic patients will have finding. So this is very interesting, which we find in both the cases, symptomatic and asymptomatic. Now, these were the findings if we see uh, esophagitis. Now let's talk about the symptomatic patients which complain of some symptoms like the GERD or maybe the, they had some acid burn, maybe burps or some, some pain in the epigastric region, 22 out of these 84 patients uh, had some or the other uh, problems like esophagitis, 16.8% uh, had gastritis. The bile and stomach was somehow the most common finding which we had. So I think the bile and stomach might be responsible for their symptoms. The bile gastritis, you can say, it's there in 81 patients. Deodonitis was detected in 23 and hiatus hernia in 17. So you find the figure common because some of the patients have combined uh, pathologies. Now, if we go to the asymptomatic end where patient never had symptoms, the findings were there in 7.1% or 98 patients uh, had findings of esophagitis, 231 gastritis. Again, the gastritis is a very common finding in asymptomatic patients. You go inside in an asymptomatic patient, put in a scope and you find some gastritis. The bile in the stomach, very common. So this is one of the most common findings we see in both the set of the patients, symptomatic and asymptomatic, the bile is there in the stomach and that might be inconsequential, we don't know. The duodenitis in 82 and the hiatus hernia in 33. So this is, this is the findings which we had. We compared these findings with the existing set of studies. I think there's a, there's the same thing was reflected. We had gastritis as the most common findings in most surgeons doing upper GI endoscopy preoperatively for a sleeve, the esophagitis being the second most common and the third most common being the duodenitis with hiatus hernia taking the fourth position. So, you know, we have a lot of studies, but gastritis overall, what we have seen in all these studies remain the most common finding in patients who undergo endoscopy for a sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, now, if we see here, what happened with us? We had patients we had to change a plan on table. So if a patient, for an instance, had a sleeve plan, we had to change it to a gastric bypass. And that we had to change to a gastric bypass because uh, uh, we find findings which were not permitting us to do a sleeve, like we had a hiatus hernia in 13 of these patients. We had esophagitis in seven of these patients. So we had to change our plan in, in, in a similar way. Uh, we had to change a plan from gastric bypass to a one anastomosis or a sleeve because we find a peptic ulcer disease in 29. 22 patients had gastritis, some had gastric ulcers, some had duodenitis. So from a gastric bypass, the plan changed to sleeve here because if you have somebody with active duodenitis or a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer or a polyp, as we see in three, three cases here, we cannot do a gastric bypass because then there is no way we can do the surveillance of this particular patient for the future. So here, plan from gastric bypass change to sleep. So if you see, uh, out of the 1900 odd patients, we had to change a plan from sleeve to a gastric bypass in 15 because of the pathologies and from gastric bypass or one anastomosis to sleeve in 32 patients. So this is in total number 47. Now, if you divide 47 by 1900 patients we did, this number turns out to be 2.7%, which means 
that the plan in 98% of the patient did not change. Two point some percent, or you can say 97% did not change. Three percent patient, we had to change the plan on the table where some had to be converted to a gastric bypass and some from gastric bypass to the sleeve. And the reasons, as you can see, we could not perform a sleeve because of grade three esophagitis, hiatus, and reasons like that. And similarly, we could not perform a gastric bypass of one anastomosis because of polyps and very high level of duodenitis, which we saw. So that's what uh, was our findings. Uh, in short, I would conclude that intraoperative endoscopy is one of the suggested approach by our center, which is doable, cost effective, safe, convenient for both patient and surgeon, and helps in diagnosis of asymptomatic UGI pathologies like severe esophagitis, gastric ulcers, polyps, which altered the plan in our case in 2.7% of patients. The solution to this controversy on, on whether to do an endoscopy is probably intraoperative endoscopy is what we suggest. Now, uh, I would uh, ask Dr. Phoebe, I think has joined us. So I would ask yeah. Dr. Phoebe to share his presentation. We missed him in between. That's why I had to cover up for his space. Uh, just to inform Dr. Phoebe that when you were absent, I discussed with them the intraoperative endoscopy, what we do, our protocol, uh, our findings of intraoperative endoscopy, how and why we change the procedure and the data from some other studies. So now you can continue, build up a base. And once you are finished with your lecture, I'm going to go inside the OR live and demonstrate you how we actually do it. Because I know that a lot of surgeons have joined and they have a lot of questions for all of us about this new or maybe a different approach we are taking. Over to Dr. Phoebe. Hello. So please unmute yourself. Yes. No. Share my screen. Yeah. Yes. No, you still have my screen uh, disabled. Sir, I am sharing with you. I am sharing your screen from my. Okay. Uh, just give me a minute. Sorry about that. Just a minute. I will uh, change slides for you. Okay. Uh, just uh, tell me whenever uh, if uh, when you want to change your slide okay okay go ahead you can start so i'm starting just a minute now you can share see yes Okay, uh, I think you saw my introduction, so let's yes, move no, on. Can start. Okay, uh, pre-op endoscopy is a hot yeah. topic, as you've seen. Go ahead. Next, Next slide. And this is the same uh, same campus, Mohawk. Uh, on the left-hand side is the research center. The medical school is the Brown Building. And uh, the specialty hospital is where we do a bariatric operation. These are my disclosures. Next. Next. And this is the case make and Mohawk. Next. Famous saying from Gandhi. Next. Okay. Now, bariatric and metabolic procedures alter the gastrointestinal anatomy. Next. And uh, some of the alterations does not permit access to the rest of the GI tract or make it impossible. Also that mobility obese patients have increased incidence of pathology and symptoms like GERD, hiatal hernia, esophageal lesions. Next. 
Sota has reported on this, where he showed 36% of the patients he evaluated out of 345 patients had reflux symptoms. On endoscopy, 53 had hiatal hernia and 31 had esophagitis. And PA studies were negative in 52 patients. Next. It also showed that in central obesity, the BMI is closely related to these complications. Also, esophageal junctional carcinoma is very common in obese patients. And in the United States, that instance is six, increased sixfold. And in the patients with BMI above 40, it's increased by five, fivefold. Next. This is a study by Gomez. Look at a pre op endoscopy for patients scheduled for bariatric surgery. He looked at 232 patients and he showed that 45% had history of GERD and 33% had uh, symptoms. He found abnormal findings in 61% of the patients. Next. This is a list of other reporters who showed abnormalities from endoscopic uh, evaluations that were done for pre op evaluation of patients scheduled for bariatric surgery. As you can see, the incidence of abnormality range all the way from 4 to 89%, averaging somewhere around 70%. Next. So why is prep endoscopy important? It can change the management of the patient. It can change some medical treatment before the procedure and does necessitate postponement of the procedure sometimes. It can change the procedure and at times, it might allow us to do additional procedures. Like sometimes we do a hiatal hernia in patients with hiatal hernia who uh, have large hiatal hernia, and we are going to do a gastric bypass. We do the hiatal hernia and then do the gastric bypass. And sometimes there's a change in the consent discussion before the surgery. Next. In the study by Gomez, he showed that 35 patients had to have medical management altered. Four patients had uh, surgical management altered or canceled because of dysplasia, barrage, and viruses. Next. This is the incidence of changes that occur from the list I presented before. It varies anywhere from 0.4% to as high as 61% uh, by Dr. Sharaf. Next. In a survey done by Dr. Cynthia Bob, he found that bariatric surgeons, some of them say it's important to do pre-op endoscopy and perform it routinely. A subgroup said they think it's an important topic, but they only perform it in only about 50% of their patients. And then there's a third group, which was a minority, that said they think it's important, but they do not perform endoscopy as part of preoperative evaluation. Next. So what are the guidelines? Up till now, the guidelines have been confusing. The last time guidelines were put out were in 2015. And at that time, most of the guidelines recommended selective uh, performance of preoperative and endoscopy. As a matter of fact, the ACS, ASMBS, SAGES, and ASGE had a joint statement for selective individualized performance of preoperative endoscopy. The only society who recommended routine endoscopy was EASC. Next. How, as you can see, the ASMBS in 2015 went for selective endoscopy. Next. And in the joint statement, they recommended selective endoscopy based on symptoms, the patients, and the findings. Next. However, in 2020, the ASMBS is going to propose routine endoscopy, and the thing is justified. Uh, this is the proposal that was sent to all the members. We all sent in our feedback. It has not been formally adapted, but I believe the Executive Council will adapt it before the end of the year. And uh, routine endoscopy, therefore, is justifiable and should be done uh, by the patients, a routine by, by, the, by the surgeon, even though they still keep it at the discretion of the surgeon. Next. If so, has a position already that was published in 2020. That position was co-authored by, the lead co-author was Dr. Wendy Brown, who is part of a panelist. And they recommend that 
upper GI endoscopy should be considered in all patients who are undergoing bariatric procedures. Next. So are there disadvantages to this procedure? Yes, the disadvantage is you have two procedures, endoscopy and a bariatric procedure. It takes away time for the patient to come for two procedures, time away from work, time for travel, time in the OR, time for the uh, surgeon to evaluate the patient, and time for the operating room use. If it's done by the endoscopist, that necessitates examination by another physician, and then the scheduling by the other physician and the time spent. If it's done by the surgeon, then it's extra time for the patient. And I would like to remark that upper GI endoscopy, which is done preoperatively, is not that pleasant. It's usually done under conscious sedation. I've had it myself, and so I know it's not the most pleasant pr uh, procedure. Overall, it increases cost. Next. What are the choices? Up to this time, you do nothing or you could do an upper GI series, which is less costly, but there's radiation exposure and more manpower involved. However, it's inadequate because you cannot do biopsies and upper GI endoscopies does not define finer mucosal details. Next. The other important thing we have to consider is we have found out that after bariatric metabolic procedures, patients develop other problems like GERD, virus esophagitis, esophageal cancer, marginal ulcers, and hiatal hernias. Therefore, it's necessary to have a baseline before doing the procedures. Next. In conclusion, patients with obesity have increased risk of upper GI symptoms and pathology. They may be asymptomatic. Bariatric metabolic surgery may itself result in upper GI pathology and symptoms. And therefore, baseline documentation of upper GI appearance is important before bariatric surgery. Next. Based on this, we recommend that upper GI endoscopy should therefore be offered routinely. Next. So what's there for the future? Today, we are going to have Dr. Bandera is going to present or show how to do a pre-op endoscopy. It is called an intraoperative pre-bariatric procedure endoscopy, which is done in the operating room at the same time when the patient is having the bariatric surgery. It is found to be effective, safe, cost-effective, and establish a baseline for us to monitor the patient's post-op. Dr. Bandero uh, demonstrated how this procedure is done. And since there was an electrical breakdown, he has already presented our findings. And now he's going to be showing you how the procedure is done. He's going to do a, a pre-op endoscopy and do a surgical procedure. And after that, the panelists will have time to ask questions. I would like to, next, I would like to thank Dr. Cynthia Bork, who shared some of her slides with me for this presentation. Next, and I would like to thank the staff at Mohawk, who have been working with me for the last four years. They helped me write the papers, make the presentations, and I want them to know it's been a pleasure working with them. Thank you. Can you go ahead? Yes, sir. Pawanji, unmute. OT1, yes. Hello. Yes, sir, we can hear you. OK. Uh, Dr. Vinik, we can't hear you. Am I audible? Yes, now. OK. Hi. Hi, everyone. So we are now in the theater. And uh, I would like to, uh, now like to invite Dr. <laughs> Mehek Bhandari, our consultant at Bariatric, uh, Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics. He'll be giving you the case history and he'll be sharing the case details with you. So over to Dr. Mehek. Good evening, everyone. So this particular case is a 30-year-old male with a height of 159 centimeters and weight of 126.8 kgs with a BMI of 50. Diet is non-vegetarian. He has no history of any addictions. As far as comorbidities are concerned, Last two. As far as comorbidities are concerned, he has osteoarthritis, OSA, hypertriglyceridemia, 
type 2 diabetes since one and a half years on OHAs and recently diagnosed hypothyroidism. So as far as blood investigations are concerned, the hemoglobin standards 13, the protein levels are 8.29, the LDL levels are 178, highly raised, the triglycerides are 333, the ESH is 6.12 and HbA1c is 6.78 and RT-PCR COVID-19 testing and CT scoring are negative. So as for the routine protocol, Dr. Mohit Bhandari will be showing you the intra-op endoscopy to rule out any pathology before starting the surgery. Because as he said in his lecture that we can have a change of plan if at all any pathology has been detected in the intra-op endoscopy. So now you will be seeing the intra-op endoscopy picture. So over to Dr. Mohit. Hello. Can you see me? Can you hear me first? Yes. Okay. Is the voice clear or it's not very clear? It's yeah. clear, but speak up a little bit. Okay, okay. So now I am going to demonstrate the intraoperative endoscopy here. So Dr. Mehak has already explained you about the patient details. So this is quite a huge patient, you know, very difficult neck. I am in the esophagus now. Uh, I try to go inside and see if we have some findings which precludes performing a Uh, the G junction is exactly at 40 centimeters. Uh, that's the Z line. As you can see, uh, I go inside there and I have this beautiful stomach. Uh, I don't see even gastritis here. Almost looks normal to me. Uh, this is the prepyloric area. Fine. I'm going to go inside into the duodenum and see if there is a pathology here. So most duodenal pathologies we usually detect while we pull the scope back. So I'm going to pull the scope a little back here while we search for any pathologies. I don't find any pathologies here. Duodenum looks okay. I come back and then I retroflex my scope to check if I have a problem there with the hiatus. The hiatus looks fine. Uh, I will do a little bit of suction here so that I remove this fluid from the fundus of the stomach. I can go back there. And once I come back, I just evacuate all the air. So that's the endoscopy which I performed. I don't feel that it precludes uh, mini gastric bypass. Now I'm going to put ports to this patient to perform the mini bypass. So we're going to perform a one anastomosis here. Uh, let me show you the condition of the bowel. So uh, this is our, so just focus on the abdomen for now in the PIP and uh, then we'll have the endoscopic view which can go inside the main screen. So uh, the first step which we're going to do after we put in a scope is ask our anesthetist to again put a gastric calibration tube and remove all the uh, fluid which is there inside the stomach. So he's going to put a tube. In the meantime, we put the ports. I don't see a lot of dilatation of the bowel. I think the bowel looks fine. I can perform any bowel associated procedure here. So uh, if you can see, we have put an optical port. I'm not going to focus too much on the uh, one anastomosis part because this is more dedicated lecture towards the intraoperative endoscopy. Uh, and the feasibility of the intraoperative endoscopy. Uh, plus, if we have difficulties in performing uh, bariatric procedures on super obese patients, so I'm going to focus more on the uh, endoscopic part dealing with uh, bowel and pathologies and uh, things of that sort. Uh, just to give you a brief recap, we had an endoscopy which turned out to be normal. We had no gastritis. The G junction was fine. It was at 40 centimeters, no esophagitis. Uh, we had uh, 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 a nice prepyloric area with the pylorus open, no bile in the stomach. The duodenum first part, second part looked normal. Uh, while putting uh, the scope in a retroflex position, we could not find a hiatus. So almost a normal endoscopy like we expected. Uh, so the ports are in. As you can see in the PIP, we have uh, around four ports two ports, uh, 12 mm, 
on the left side in mid clavicular line on the right side again mid clavicular line two finger breadths above the optical port and we are ready to perform the procedure uh, but the first step before performing the procedure uh, the anesthetist would come in put in the bougie and would suck all the fluid which is present into the fundal area so you can see this is the fundus and i usually put more water than air while i do these procedures so that's the first step we want to evacuate so we ask the anesthetist to come in and he is evacuating all this fluid from that particular part so that's it take it out the fluid is evacuated we have this nice stomach here i can easily perform the endoscopy and so is the situation of the bowel let me just show you the bowel it's fine it does not creates problem in pneumoperitoneum or the space for us to do any procedure now let me start the procedure it's going to be a short procedure because we just going to do a one anastomosis this is the area of the uh crow's feet we're going to go here make a space to enter into the lesser sac you know one anastomosis is a shorter procedure because it's just one anastomosis so we usually would not have to uh, do a lot of dissection close to the g junction you can see i have enter into the lesser sac i take a stapler and the first one i fire usually is a gold uh, we had a very nice course just around 2 days back dedicated to one anastomosis with some australian group of surgeons where i demonstrate around five procedures including one revision on one anastomosis gastric bypass and there also we demonstrated a lot of these endoscopic procedures so this is the first fire done around 2 cm from the pylorus so this is the pylorus there's the first part of the duodenum there is the cbd there and then uh, we just go with a blue cartridge way up doing the division so this is the remnant here and we always pay attention that the remnant remains here to drain properly so that we do not have issues uh now i'm going to ask my anesthetist to bring in the buji and uh, just will first lock the stapler so that he gets an easy passage because sometimes the anesthetist is bringing in the buji because of a large dilated fundus can remain there and struggle in the area of the fundus so you can see the buji coming in very swiftly it goes inside and now we can just continue with our firings yeah i usually use a 38 french buji because that's what is available in india and we usually do not go very close or above to the buji either because this is sort of a, a non obstructed bypass procedure so that's what is going on at the end of the procedure once i perform the anastomosis i'm going to demonstrate you the endoscopic finding what intra operative anatomy we created and how does it look on endoscopy immediate post operatively so we also check for some bleeding if it is there some oozing inside and uh, if we have some oozing from the site of the anastomosis or the site of uh, the area where we fired the stapler the junction between the small bowel and the uh, stomach so that's what we have to see this liver is not one of the best livers i would appreciate for a live case uh it's not that that good a liver but still we are going on we are firing and you can see that we have almost reached the g junction i think that should be the ultimate firing maybe the penultimate one uh, i would need some anesthetic agent to be given to the patient the patient is light so that would help me now if we see here uh uh this is the area of the g junction i am almost there and uh, the best way here is i usually would not dissect a lot close to the g junction but i would come and close this as i am doing here so that's my last firing and i am done with my division of the stomach i can put a gauze there most of this bleeding is going to stop by the end of the procedure we just put a gauze there the patient is light so the blood pressure is a little high we have already requested our anesthetist to put him back to sleep that can often happen when we uh, do now this is the posterior part of the stomach so you can see that 
we have a lot of fat here i'm going to remove this fat and uh, dissection is done so that we do not encounter bleeding while we fire the staple here because this fat usually is um a little thicker than what we expect now this is a gastrotomy i do posterior to the staple line with the anesthetist helping to push the bougie in we can see the blue of the bougie there so that's the gastrotomy done now the most important part is to count this bobble so i have markings done on my graspers both the graspers will have markings so you can see this is a 10 here and i can have another grasper with the marking so these are both 10 marked here now what i wanted to express even before the bowel is not that dilated you can see and you know usually what i realize that even if we have some air which comes from the duodenum to the small bowel it's just the initial 10 cm so that's uh, that's the patient there you would want anesthetist to supine uh, and make the patient a little straight so that we can trace the anatomy so that anatomy can be demonstrated to all of you now this is the ligament of trites I don't see inferior mesenteric vein because of a lot of fat but nevertheless let's count start to count so that's 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 90 100 110 120 130 to 140 150 160 170 180 so that's the length which we use usually to bypass at our center 180 has been the standard for one anastomosis and we will make a entrotomy here a very small one though Okay, here, and then we make use this gastrotomy to do the anastomosis. I I always request my anesthetist to take out the bougie only when I am inside with the stapler because it aids in helping me to you know get a little more closer to the area I need to enter my staple into. So that's a posterior. gastrointestinal anastomosis we'll clean our camera once i always uh, would not uh, uh, go ahead and do a procedure if the camera is not clean so we clean it once so that i can see and demonstrate better we are again inside and now i can just repair this and do an endoscopy for all of us to see how the internal anatomy looks like as far as the feasibility of doing an intraoperative endoscopy I think I demonstrated that yes, a mini gastric bypass is feasible. We can do a bypass procedure after doing a intraoperative endoscopy because I feel that the bowel was not that dilated. Uh, stomach had a little fluid, uh, as I could see, which was very nicely evacuated by our anesthetist. So that's fine. Now. that gives us the freedom of i was actually you know in the morning i was discussing with my team that we might have to change the procedure uh, considering the fact that there would be some findings and i had this gut feeling but this time my gut feeling was wrong and we never had findings to convert this into a sleeve uh, otherwise that would have been a learning for us that procedures do have to change as i said uh in with our own data which i already expressed and we'll discuss with dr wendy brown and dr khatan as to what is their experience uh, we had to change this uh, procedure which we plan only in just say around mm, maybe 2% as i demonstrated 2.7% exactly uh, not not very common and and i have never had a patient who complained because uh, at the end of the day they understand that the best thing Uh, for them lies in the hand of the surgeon and that's what they consent for so 
uh, they they just say that you know whatever is the best you feel now for example i this, this liver is not as bad it's 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 a fatty liver but not 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 sclerotic per se for example i would have entered inside the last case which i did just before this uh, vbu started was uh, supposedly a, a a a gastric bypass which i had to do a banded bypass but we entered inside and the liver was badly sclerotic although nothing was re reported on the ultrasound scans um, it was just mild fatty liver so the findings are so different uh, when you see them intraoperatively on a uh, laparoscopic visualization and that changed the entire course of my way of dealing with that patient and i had to change the procedure from a bypass to a sleeve because uh, that was a bad liver i took a biopsy of the liver and then um, you know uh, changed the procedure the port position is a little challenge uh, if you have a normal endoscopy uh, where you wanted to do a, a bypass but you end up having a very very bad liver once you put the first scope uh, if you have put other scopes but if you put a optical port first like most centers do and then do a scopy and then put other ports and your optical port doesn't change for a sleeve or a bypass then that's that's not a problem you can obviously uh, tackle that so this is done the mini bypass is over we never close uh, internal hernia defects in our mini bypass because we never had the incidence of internal hernia in odd 4000 cases done i'm going to go do an endoscopy and then i'm going to shift myself to the studio uh, for discussion uh, on what we did when we do an endoscopy post operatively we block both the limbs so both these limbs will be blocked by my assistant using a grasper i'm already with my endoscope uh, what i need to check is if i have any bleed significant bleed inside if i have some other problem so this is the esophagus you can find that there's a little bit of blood can i have the pip view shift to okay great i have a little bit of blood here so i'm going to suck it this usually would come because of the buji bringing in the blood this is my staple line um looks okay i'm going to go inside this is the anastomosis you can see so that's the anastomosis which we created it does not look like bleeding this is the efferent loop and there there is the afferent loop i take this scope back so you can see both the loops very nicely that's the beautiful anastomosis it does not bleed this is the staple line when i pull the scope back 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 so that's not bleeding either there's a small oozing here i think that would settle down with time so i'm going to just remove my scope thank you very much for your patient listening i'm going to come to the studio in the meantime dr phobi can interact with wendy and uh, dr khatan and i can bring my questions back i'll i'll go to the studio in just in a minute's time so over to dr phobi i'm share my video okay. all right thank you excellent presentation of intraoperative endoscopy followed by the bariatric procedure uh the assistant consultant is going to measure the length of the pouch intraoperatively so that is also documented and uh we didn't want to take your time to demonstrate all of that and then the momentum that was taken under the pouch would be take brought down to the normal anatomy so uh we don't leave it up packed there and then um as dr bandera says we do not do Hello. internal hernia repair so at this time uh, as dr bandera goes to the studio i would uh, turn it over to dr wendy brown and manish katan if they have any questions or comments i have i have to put my video on you have to help me out i am not able to okay, okay. i'm allowing you So yeah, please, I think. So please ask your uh, uh, share your video. Okay. Really... Dr. Manish is going to share a video. No, 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 I'm not going to share. I'm not visible, but that's okay. If I'm audible, it's more important. Sir, I'm uh, requesting you to share your video. I start my video, but I'm not able to. You know, I'm, I'm just putting it, uh, clicking on start my video, but I'm not able. To. You may have to use the arrow at the bottom of your left to advance it. There's a screen down there. A pointer. An arrow. Okay. 
Okay, Wendy, you were going to make a comment while we wait? Oh, it was very, um, a very nice demonstration um, of the endoscopy and also the procedure. So, you know, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting looking at your very large case series of preoperative um, endoscopy that um, the asymptomatic and symptomatic patients who ended up having pathology was very similar to what we found in the systematic review associated with the if so position statement, so around 25%. No. And um, similarly, I think in the if so position statement, there were around about 0.4% where we found an absolute contraindication to surgery such as a cancer on the systematic review. But there was about 16% where treatment was delayed and that was, um, or changed. Um, I note that you, you change your procedures about 4% of the time, but what about if you saw something that needs to be treated um, or potentially should be treated before you proceed with the bariatric procedure, like a severe reflux esophagitis or um, gastritis for that matter, or a gastric ulcer, would you pull out in that circumstance? Mohit, you wanted to answer that or you want yeah. me to? Uh, yeah, can, can, I, can you repeat your question, Wendy? I'm sorry. Sure. I just... Yeah, no, no problems. So, in the if so position statement, around about when we did the systematic review, we identified about 16% of the time that a preoperative um, endoscopy altered the management. It didn't necessarily stop them proceeding, but it either meant there was a delay whilst an ulcer was treated, gastritis was treated, or um, esophagitis was treated, or the same as what you were describing, perhaps they changed from a sleeve to a bypass or a bypass to a sleeve. Now, when you do your endoscopies at the time of the um, index operation, how often would you need to pull out to treat something like esophagitis or a gastric ulcer? Yeah. Not just change your procedure, but change your management. Yeah. Very nice question, Wendy. I think uh, that's, that's an important predicament which one can face. Uh, we had aborted procedures in certain special circumstances. The first, if we find a duodenal growth. So if we find a duodenal growth or esophageal growth or a growth in the gastric part, uh, any part of the stomach, maybe fundus or maybe anywhere, we would usually go for a narrow band imaging followed by a biopsy of that particular lesion. Although we have a frozen facility, but at that stage, we do not move ahead with the procedure. That's one circumstance. For treating esophagitis, for treating gastric ulcers, I would say I never had an occasion where we had an ulcer which was a bleeding ulcer or an ulcer which was badly infected that we had to completely postpone the procedure and get back again after two or three months or maybe treating that and get to an, another OPD endoscopy and come back. We never had such an occasion. The only one occasion we had one, not, not one means one, the only one type of occasion we had to change the course of what we are doing is when we found growths, which we have the facility of frozen section, but having said that, because we are not cancer specialists here, uh, we don't deal with cancers here, we would take a biopsy. Uh, obviously send it for a frozen, but send the main biopsy and call it a day for that particular case. Then the patient would come back once we have uh, those biopsies. Uh, at some time, having said that, I have had issues of finding the most common thing was a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And, and, and we have, uh, when we have, uh, we have had that, uh, we started them with imitinib mesylate and then call them after six months and the lesion almost disappears. As you know that these, these, medications can treat the GIST tumors once we have done the immunotyping and all those things. But again, this is not a part of my, uh, my expertise. Uh, I'm a pure bariatric surgeon, so I don't deal with malignancies. I abort the procedure. Uh, esophagitis, uh, mild ulcers, mild esophagitis, or even severe esophagitis, uh, duodenal polyps uh, have been reported. We obviously biopsy the polyps, uh, but they do not change the uh, they do not abort the procedure. We do not abort the procedure. We just go ahead and change the procedure as I mentioned uh, in my data. 
Great. And how do your patients cope with the consent process? Um, I'm, when I was a junior surgeon, when we used to deal with breast cancers, we'd do needle biopsies or biopsies on the table and the patients didn't know what operation they were going to wake up with until um, we got the frozen section back. And we stopped doing that because the patients didn't cope well with not knowing what procedure they, they were going to undergo, whether or not it was going to be a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. Um, or nothing if it came back as benign. So we moved to doing pre-operative biopsies. So I guess using that example, how do your patients feel about the fact that they may get a sleeve or they may get a mini bypass, or one anastomosis bypass, sorry, I should say, or they may get a raw myogastric bypass? Do they yeah, do you yeah. think they worry about that? Yeah, Wendy, that's a, that's a very, very good question, actually. You know, uh, I, I have had this uh, different experience than the Western world here in India. Uh, my patients do not worry about that. I can tell you very honestly. I, uh, you know, Dr. Phoebe, he has been with me for four years. Before the pre phobe era for me, uh, my patient used to get the procedure he wanted. But after Dr. Phoebe came in, he taught me to decide as a surgeon the procedure which is the best for the patient, not to give the patient what patient wants to. So I, for one person, would sit with him in the counseling room myself and would show him my data that, see, this is my data of intraoperative endoscopy. Uh, we have had chances of as high as 3% to change the procedure. But if we are changing the procedure, which is planned for you from a sleeve to a bypass intraoperatively, that's for your good. It, it is for your future. It is for what is going to stay with you for 40, 50, or 100 years, not, not for us to, you know, not for, our, for a benefit to us. So that's one thing that, that we make them understand that sleeve is a reflexogenic procedure. And, and if you have a sleeve with a severe esophagitis, you have full chances, chances of getting converted that esophagitis into barrets and that barrets into a malignancy. Similarly, if you have a duodenal polyp there and somehow we lose the access to the first part of the duodenum because of a gastric bypass, then God forbid, and you have that malignancy which grows and then you come up with a stage four lesion, then we have nothing in our hands but to do a chemo and do a palliation for you. So, so you know, Wendy, it's, it's both the ways. It's how you counsel your patient. So I have decided, and if, if some, some of my, you know, I had this initially when just Dr. Phoebe joined, I was very reluctant to this idea of, you know, asking the patient to let it be my choice to decide the procedure. So forget about endoscopy. If a patient turns to my clinic with a particular profile, I decide the procedure. Patient would not decide the procedure. And if the patient decides the procedure, then he decides the surgeon and not me, because then he decides the surgeon he wants to choose, which he can happily go to any other center and do it. But if he comes to our center, we decide the procedure and the freedom to change it intraoperatively. And to be very honest with you, it has only increased the trust uh, and the credence of me as a surgeon in front of my patient because when I change the procedure, I take him through the videos, show him the endoscopic findings and then decide that now I'm changing a procedure. And, and we are now talking about endoscopy. Let's talk about the liver. That's, that's more common a situation where you, in the ultrasound scans you, because we don't do regular elastographies for all our, all our patients except for if there's a need, it's a cost to us. So we, we just ask them to do ultrasound scan and it does not report anything more than a fatty liver. We go inside, put in a scope and we find it's, it's cross cirrhosis. And, and those cases, if the patient consented for a one anastomosis, we're not gonna go ahead and do a one anastomosis and have him you know, land up having a liver transplant six months after our procedure because one anastomosis causes rapid, rapid weight loss. So I, for one, would tell him that, you know, there are situations which a surgeon is posed inside the operating room where the surgeon decides the best in the favor of the patient. He's just like your, you know, somebody who takes care of you, He's the closest person to the patient. He's there, he would decide it for you. And I, I have not a single patient had refused me. They have taken it very positively. In fact, it has, let patients saying to other patients that Dr. Bhandari has an algorithm. Dr. Phoebe and Dr. Bhandari sits with an algorithm. 
they do not do the procedure or perform the procedure which is technically easier or simpler everything is easier and everything is difficult they do what is best suited for us and i am one person i share my algorithm with all my patients you know openly it's it's shared on our osi group it's shared with all our team our fellows and everybody and and the patient reads it and they find logic in it and then they think that what we are doing for them is the best so that that answers your question there it's very positive i've never had a patient who have refused me or you had problems and they was they started grumbling no it never it all depends upon how you counsel them pre operatively these problems would tend to happen if you commit them falsely of a procedure and you don't inform them that you, that you can change the procedure intraoperatively so i think we have a very very important informed consent session a confidence building session which uh, helps us you know stay away from uh, problems uh great mohit if you all can hear me may i i am allowed to ask you something yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. thank you mohit for a great presentation and putting an insight into the intraoperative endoscopy as wendy has correctly mentioned i have also gone through the ifso statement if so if so position statement about pre operative endoscopy and in that if correct me if wendy i am wrong 7.6% there is a change in plan of surgery if you do a pre surgery endoscopy in contrast to 2.7% on table endoscopies so there is a quite a difference of 5% you know so this change of plan is because esophagitis as she has mentioned there is esophagitis there can be a change of plan which has the patient has to be explained afterwards so this change of plan is not going to affect our final outcome i suppose mohit yeah yeah it's not going to affect our final outcome absolutely i i i would say i would say that uh, you know in fact it would be positive if we change the procedure intraoperatively in the favor of the patient it's going to be more positive outcomes i would say uh, and as you have already told you take a very good consent you explain them very well and uh, you make a plan go inside you can change your plan after changing your plan have you ever seen a patient who is who is suppose you have planned an ngb and you go inside and you do a sleep and the patient is a super super obese patient so then what can be the next plan if the patient doesn't lose his weight properly or you know you do a reendoscopy assess that polyp again and if it is not turning into a cancer you can have a ngb at a later date or something like that yeah that's a that's a very valid step which we all take i mean i i have done a um, lot of sleeves on super obese patients and all of them would come back to us irrespective after 5 years to get it revised into some of the other procedure and i think you correctly mentioned that we can regularly endoscope them and if it does not turn out to be a malignant lesion and we are sure um we can obviously go ahead and maybe arrange a polypectomy for them and then maybe follow up endoscopies and then go ahead and we can do a bypass procedure as a revision next stage procedure there is no harm in that i agree uh, i i i i sort of uh, you know if we talk about sleeve or a mini gastric bypass in super obese patients both of them would good good weight loss in the first one year or so which is the surveillance period for these sort of lesions which we you know need to follow so patients are mostly satisfied even if we change the procedure because the weight loss is not too much of a difference between the two uh but uh, i feel that the problems which we would face if we do not change the procedure and stick to what we have promised uh, them specifically you know i'm more concerned about uh, high grades of esophagitis uh, hiatus hernia where surgeons i have seen uh, would even in large hiatus would repair the hiatus and do a sleeve for the heck of doing it i think dr phobi can comment on it but i don't feel that you know that should be done uh because in the longer run we will have patients who will have more complaints than uh having positive attitude towards what we have done for them so you know I, that I that's my what is your opinion dr oh uh, basically uh you two things you raised the higher incidence from the ifso report when we encounter gastritis or or 
incidence of ulcers, we let those patients get a sleeve. And that is why we, other centers would treat that patient medically before they subject them to the sleeve. Uh, we have not found that that has been a problem because all of our patients are on PPI for six weeks to three months or even longer, whether they have gastritis or not. The second aspect is we have an algorithm. So for instance, in a super obese patient like this, if we'd gone in and uh, we had planned to do an MGV and we find out that the patient has contraindications by having a high hernia or has esophagitis, then we'll do a bypass, but we won't do a routine bypass. We'll do a banded bypass because our data, our statistics shows that a band, banded bypass is, is as effective as the one anastomosis gastric bypass at five to six years follow up. We wouldn't do a routine gastric bypass because we know that in 30% plus, the gastric bypass patients start failing at four and five years. So if we have a patient on the other hand, who we went in to do an MGB and found the patient had gastritis and peptic ulcer uh, problems, and we decide to do a sleeve, at that time we do a banded sleeve because our data so far shows that the bandage sleeve is as equal to the one anastomosis gastric bypass at five and six years follow up. So it allows us to see the rest of that gastrointestinal tract, treat them for ulcer disease, and yet not have a remnant stomach which is not accessible. So that combining the technique we have now, plus our algorithm, all of these things are discussed with the patients preoperatively. And then when the surgery is done, if there's a change, we take the endoscopic findings and the laparoscopic findings, and we sit down with the patient and say, look, this is what we told you. This is what we found. And that's why we changed it. The patients feel they're part of the informed consent. And uh, when I first came to India with Dr. Bandari, we were used to people walking in, like going into a grocery store or a pharmacist and demanding, I want to sleep. And I told him, you know the doctor, you know the surgeon, you are a salesman, mm -hmm. and the patient is making the choice of the color of the pizza or the hamburger, the size they want. You should be able to evaluate the patient and treat the patients appropriately. Occasionally, the patients will want something and insist on it. We would have to weigh the consequences. We are talking about probabilities here. So a patient with good symptoms has a high probability of near GERD and problems, but it's not a hundred percent. So if you have a patient who has symptoms of GERD and you recommend a gastric bypass and the patient absolutely does not want a gastric bypass, then you advise that patient, we're going to do your operation, but this is the curve we have. This is our experience with the sleeve without the band. You're going to have excellent weight loss from 60 to 80 percent, but in three years, you're going to start gaining weight. You understand that? You say, yes, then you have to come back and we might have to do a gastric bypass, a mini gastric bypass or a city. The patient will say, like, I'll take my chance. And that is part of the informed consent. So we're not dictatorial. But what has been impressive is that when we have informed the patients adequately, most of them have given preoperative pre consents as to what choice we make at surgery. And most of them will be happy, at least all of them that we have converted have been happy with the conversion. Uh, great. Thank you. I have a last question. Uh, what about H. pylori infection, which is uh, very rampant in this part of the world? A lot of times, postoperatively also, we have seen that the patient has a nagging pain, comes out with the HP positive, and then we have to give drugs. So during surgery, I have read your paper, Mohit. We are excluding H. pylori. We are not doing biopsies. And in a normal stomach, the H. pylori postoperatively can sometimes, in our series, 0.8 to 1%, it can create problem, ulcers, and nagging pain. So what's your opinion about that? Yeah, that's, that's something when we started doing uh, intraoperative endoscopy, that was one thing which created doubt in my mind that, you know, we are not taking biopsies. But then I went through all the data. Uh, there is actually no consensus on that. Um, most surgeons would treat it empirically and would not 
you know, change or would not abort a procedure, go ahead and do a procedure. What I decided personally is that if we have found severe gastritis, in all such cases, we just do a sleeve. Because if you leave a remnant with very severe gastritis, uh, there is no access available. So most severe forms of gastritis, we have taken some biopsies and we send them and then we do a sleeve and then treat them if the biopsy turns out to be positive for H. pylori or whatever it is. In any case, now our protocol determines that we give six months of antacids to all our patients who are on sleeves and almost lifelong antacids to patients who are on mini bypass and around one year antacids to patients who are on gastric bypass. But if we find severe gastritis or a gastric ulcer which is infected, in fact, the infected gastric ulcer which, which, which has active infection, that case I would abort, I would not touch it. Or an infected duodenal ulcer which has, you know, pus on the base, no healthy granulation, I, I would abort that case like I would do for a, a, a mass lesion or something. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would, I never found some data which could suggest that first treat H. pylori and then do these bariatric procedures or it's, it's something which is a norm or something which suggests that there is sufficient data to say that no, you cannot operate upon patients with gastritis, first take a biopsy, do a H. pylori test, treat them and then call them back again. So that, that's, that's what is my answer to your question. Uh, I have one other question which was related to the previous question which Wendy asked is that maybe what you do at, in India is your cultural issue you know culturally maybe the patients are like agreeing to what doctor says uh, yes that that may be true uh, but you know I gave a very different answer when Dr. Phoebe asked me to do this I said no my culture does not permit me this so so don't don't force me into doing something which Indian culture does not permit and and what Dr. Phoebe said try it for a month and the Indian culture would permit and then I tried it for a month and then I thought oh this culture permits so at the end of the day, you know, culture is, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's how you do the counseling, how you confirm and, you know, put an impression upon your patient and how you build that confidence. That's more, more important than the cultural variation. You see, I came to that decision back in the States when uh, the VBG became very popular. I did the first prospective randomized study between the gastric bypass and the VBG. And the initial weight loss was very impressive. And Dr. Mason, the father of uh, the gastric bypass, was pushing for the VBG. And I just stood my ground. That is why many times when you talk to people, they may think that I founded the gastric bypass. No, Dr. Mason did. As a matter of fact, I got introduced to the gastric bypass 10 years after Dr. Mason. The difference is that when everybody abandoned the gastric bypass in the 70s, uh, 78, starting with the VBG and the gastroplasty, and I did the study, I went back to gastric bypass. And the 80s, for most of the 80s, I was one of the few centers that did gastric bypass while everybody was doing VBG. And I found out that the patients were happy when I told them why I was doing such a complicated procedure. Because patients used to come in looking for the gastric bypass or the adjustable band and say, that's what I want. I said, sorry, I won't do it because these are the results. And I found out that more than 90% of the patients that were convinced stayed with me and those who weren't went somewhere else. And with that, I've learned and other surgeons have learned to become proactive, to be the decision makers, to be the scientists. And when I came to India, I found the same resistance. But after a while, Dr. Bandera realized it and the patients want to be part of the decision making. And if you try it in your practice, you would. Most surgeons who turn the responsibility to the patients are salesmen. They want to do a sleeve, a quick procedure, and I say, the patient came and asked for a sleeve, so I give it to him. But the patient is gonna come back five years later with weight regain. Is that fair? Or, and I think the limitation is most surgeons have not taken the time to learn how to do the various procedures. That's the beautiful thing at Mohawk Bioretic and Robotic Surgery Center. We're able to do gastric bypass, MGBs, sleeves, banded gastric bypass, banded MGBs, SADIS. And at this time, we do endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy for some patients who want it, who request it. Some of them really have indication because they have BMI between 27 and 35. Some of them don't really 
have the indication because they have a BMI of 45 to 50, but they don't want surgery. We do that and we tell them, you're gonna come back for the real procedure. And believe it or not, it ends up being a good converter for patients who come in with a big BMI one and ECG, ESG. They lose that 19 kilo, kilograms or 17 kilograms and they gain the weight back and it's okay, I'm coming now for the real thing. So uh, it's nice to have the various bariatric procedures in your armamentarium. Any other, any other audience? Somebody, I see you, Dr. Yeah. Ugale is with us. Yeah, Dr. Ugale is there. The comments? He asked the question asked about the things. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I really enjoyed all this. I had asked some questions on the side, but since they were not being answered, I thought maybe I had better ask them myself. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, okay, one of the points was that Mohit, you never had a problem with dilatation of the bowel at all, ever, after doing the endoscopy? Uh, no, I, you know, if, if I would say we have done now almost like 3,000 cases, one, not more than one to 10, you can say, I, I could not remember very honestly. Plus I could say that even if I had some dilatation, to be honest, yeah. that was there in, on the first 15 to 20 centimeters of the bowel from the DJ flexion. Yeah, you mentioned and, that. Yeah. yeah. And that's usually the area where we do not perform these anastomoses. So the air, plus I don't use air. I use carbon dioxide insufflation and we, you know, I feel that if you're using carbon dioxide insufflation and giving 100% oxygen to the patient, this gets absorbed pretty, pretty fast, very fast. So I, I for one reason would feel yes, sometimes when you have a duodenal polyp or an ulcer there, which you want to uh, sort of see carefully doing a narrow band imaging. Uh, I had issues where I had some air, but I never had air beyond 25 to 30 centimeters of my bowel, which okay. would create problems. Uh, having said that, if somebody has that kind of a problem, I came out with certain solutions for that. Now, like, uh, like for example, if we are doing a gastric bypass and for instance, you have some dilatation, uh, I always do the pouch first. Yeah. So that gives time for the carbon dioxide to absorb. And by the time I'm down in the infracolic compartment, it's all gone. Okay, the reason I, I asked you this is because, uh, and the background is that I have been doing endoscopies for a long, long time. I mean, I've learned from Professor Shrikande that uh, surgeons, uh, uh, and this was ever since uh, or before the president of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Royal College of Edinburgh had said in his address that surgeons need to do endoscopy. And this was way back. Now, uh, so I've been actually used to doing this. Now, in one of the patients some years ago, when we uh, had planned a, a, an ideal interposition for this patient, we, we did the endoscopy and, and we came out. And then when we went in with the laparoscope, uh, he probably his, uh, what we had advised him for preparation, maybe he didn't follow it or whatever, but the small bowel was so dilated that I gave up uh, uh, the procedure. I went, I did only the sleeve at that time. And I told him after some time, we'll go ahead with the ileal interposition. But this gentleman never showed up after that. He went on saying, yes, he'll come back, but he never came back. So, so what we do now is, uh, a lot of the times we do an intraoperative endoscopy, as you've shown. We go in with the, uh, with the laparoscope and one or two other ports. And then with a grasper, we place it on the duodenum and then do the endoscopy. And only when we want to have a look in the first part of duodenum and second part, we quickly go in and come out and again have the grasper there. So now we've ensured that we never have any dilatation of the small bowel ever. So I just thought I'd share that experience uh, with you about that. In fact, in fact, Dr. Phoebe suggested me this, what you are saying, he suggested me to block the duodenum. <laughs> I, I assured him that I won't have a problem without even blocking it. He, in fact, this was what he, he primarily taught me that you can block the duodenum and 
it's very yeah. easy it's not that difficult you know and, and you, you need you need not put a lot of pressure there like you said go there observe the stomach and then once you have to go inside the bone just remove it a little bit and then not too much of air goes uh honestly i never had uh, such problems uh in fact uh, uh why we uh, we were when we were while we were doing these procedures in, in some of our initial uh, cases by the fellows specifically we had problems of dilatation a lot of these uh, uh but as i said once you do the supracolic part by the time you come down it's it's done if you see my data there were around 16 cases i was not able to perform these uh, procedures yeah. so one interesting case which i remembered as i said was a case where uh, i i did a endoscopy and i was supposed to do a silk sleeve now when you are supposed to do a silk sleeve and that patient was supposedly a young female with a bmi of around 48 uh and the zipo umbilical distance was pretty high so i end up dilating the bowel and by the time i was entering inside with the scope my scope was getting smudged and it became very difficult it became very messy uh the next time i came uh, in the morning i, I said dr kobi that see uh, we we not going to do uh, endoscopies in patients with cells and and he he literally brutally assaulted me he said your principles cannot change if you do cells or pills or anything you do you have to follow the principle either you do it pre operatively or or you do it intra operatively but you cannot change your principles uh, just because you want to accommodate your comfort uh, the next time i went inside more cautiously using minimalistic air you know a little little more cautious because what the tendency what we have we learn from most endoscopists we continuously keep our hands on that insufflation yeah i know what i decided is then i learn slowly that i keep half my finger over it and i slowly go inside and you know you just need just need sufficient air the optimization of the air inside to just see that cavity you need not blow it to blast it so then i i in cells patient i started uh, doing it myself and did not permitted fellows to do the endoscopy because fellows are you know they take time they would just put in the air they want to learn things they are very excited and you know they are little cautious also so then i started doing and then next time you know i did so this case series which we presented is actually you know 2000 odd cases so i am not talking about one case or two case or three we have been and, and you know when we planned this webinar dr phobi specifically wanted me to demonstrate uh, the intra operative endoscopy and i said i'm going to end it there so he said no you demonstrate the entire case because you can do a mini bypass in odd 18 minutes so let them see that it's possible because when you talk something and do something else it decreases your credibility so let them see that you can do it do the procedure uh, without bypassing the protocols and that would prove your point so that's what i did today i <laughs> see that uh, we have such few surgeons who have logged in i mean it just shows that people are either not interested maybe webinar burnouts i don't know but there's such little attendance and i'm really surprised with that Uh, no, we, um, it's really the attendance here does not reflect. We are. This okay. is on Facebook. Okay, this okay. Is, this is going All live on Facebook, on LinkedIn, yeah. on. Uh, actually, yeah. actually, my you won't see a lot of people on Zoom because they're already getting it on the Facebook, okay. on the IBC, on the LinkedIn, on YouTube channels, on Instagram. So you know the young surgeons, they are more. Uh, they they like more the social media than going on the Zoom and attending a meeting. So that's. That's it. And plus, I'm going to put the recordings everywhere. So uh, our intention was to, you know, have a closed group meeting and then take it to. Uh, I feel great right about it. Uh, Mohit, you're absolutely uh, correct. Mohit, you're absolutely correct. The whole idea of the function is just to make learning available on all platforms, and everybody who wants to learn. I'm not talking about everybody who is already learned, but who wants to learn, like Gale or myself. Uh, we should we should learn in any ways we should learn there is no no shortcuts there is no shortcuts no i can i can suggest you you know my linkedin profile i linkedin live i never knew that that's so effective i i am doing this linkedin live and i can send you there are 50 questions they are already logged in so the linkedin live probably is becoming more you know surgeons are everywhere and they get one social media platform they can see your video and then they just hook yes. into that and keep on following that 
Okay, something. let me go now to Wendy. Wendy, do you have any comments? We invited you and you meet this time and you're all the way in Melbourne. Any comments? No, I think um, we covered a lot of very interesting ground tonight. It's been very interesting and um, and I take all, all the points on board um, about the consent and about, um, I guess, patient education being a very important part of this. Um, and I think it's very interesting and, you know, very good data that you've collected prospectively and it sort of fascinated me how close it is to the meta-analysis that we did in the, um, for the IFSO position statement, that your findings were very similar. So, yes, uh, that, was, that was one of the questions uh, I got asked when we started. Well, you're doing this endoscopy, it averages about five minutes from what we see. Are you going to be able to find a, pathology as well as a gastroenterologist does who takes 15, 20 minutes. And so when we compared our results, they're just as good and the findings are almost equal. The, sometimes the minute gastritis are not picked up by us, but we don't miss anything that would make a difference. So I want to thank you for your participation. I hear you see Dr. Marin one, you join us. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, he, okay. he, had a, he had a very specific question. His question is very interesting. Now he says, yes. you, you go ahead and you wanted to do a gastric bypass, but suppose you find a duodenal polyp and you did end up doing a sleeve. Now, what about the comorbidities? Now the patient is diabetic, so you give him a procedure which... So what is your answer? Dr. Phoebe can answer that. Remember, a sleeve is a metabolic operation. Uh, from all the data we got that the gastric bypass is more effective in treating a diabetic. Uh, but again, you give the patient the best operation at that time, which is a sleeve because you're worried about malignancy. And uh, we know that people who are in cancer endemic areas like in Korea and Japan uh, would normally do a sleeve. If we really feel strong about it, we would do the sleeve and then do a duodenal jejunal room while gastric bypass. That is a sleeve bypass, which is an accepted treatment in a patient whom you think really needs it. It's a slightly more complicated operation than a regular row Y, but it's a very popular operation that is done in China and is done in Taipei, Taiwan, and Japan, because those areas are also and cancer endemic areas. Dr. Manish Katan, the other panelists, any comments or questions who would be closing the session? Manish? Dr. Phoebe, can I ask something in the meanwhile? Sure. Yes. Something about what Mohit just mentioned and what you uh, answered just now. So uh, uh, of late, when we want to do a bypass, instead of doing OAGB or an MGB, we have been, uh, and also instead of doing a classical SASE, because we found nutritional issues with SASE, we do a sleeve with a 200 centimeter BP link. So, so it's actually like a, nearly like a GJ. Uh, so we do a sleeve and a gastro uh, jejunal anastomosis at 200 centimeters. That's so, right, that's a loop. With a loop, uh, a loop yes. yes. Yeah, so if you do a procedure like this, if you have your polyp in the duodenum or whatever, you have surveillance of the sleeve stomach, you have the duodenum, and you have endoscopy of the, of the anastomosis also. And there, yes. is, there is no blind area in this procedure. And we, we are finding the results of this so good that we now are tending to do more and more of these and uh, in some time, we will we'll get our data out and uh, where I will propose that we would be able to replace a OAGB by a procedure like this. And Definitely. Uh, that work has been done by C.K. Wong who, and he's published on it with long-term follow-up. Okay. And that is the topic of a future seminar, a sleeve through wild gastric bypass and the merits. And uh, it turns out to be slightly less complicated than was thought because you're doing most of the dissection right above the supercolic area and you don't have to go right up there to the GE junction. 
Okay, yeah, with yeah. that, uh, Dr. Bandari, if you have any closing remarks, I would appreciate it are, because are, we're going to get this at 90 minutes. Yes, there are two questions which somebody has asked. If you permit, I can answer them. They, they, they are they are asking about uh, post-op endoscopies, which we perform. Yes. So they're saying that on-table endoscopies just after performing the procedure, will it cause leaks? Uh, I personally don't think so. You have to be cautious while handling the scope. As I said, minimal air and be very cautious. If you have a leak or something, try and repair it because fresh repairs, they, they all stay there. And if you feel that there is a larger leak, maybe refashion, but be cautious and that can happen. That's a possibility which, which one should be careful about while doing post-op endoscopies. Don't push in a lot of air because you have blocked the distal passage. So that creates a very high pressure zone there. Number two about narrow band imaging in uh, bariatric surgery. We have not much of an experience with that, but just to begin uh, with some training, we started using the NBI mode to check for the ulcers, to check for gastritis, not immediate preoperative, but mostly post-operative when we do these endoscopies in follow-ups. Uh, we are using NBI now very regularly to check for ulcers and Barrett's and and osteomotic ulcers and things like that. So that's that's these are the two questions which I had. I think apart from that, I'm I'm good. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank all the participants and the audience, uh, particularly Dr. Brown from Melbourne and Dr. Ketan, our panelists from Ahmedabad, and I want to thank Dr. Ba uh, Mohit Bandari. Uh, at this time, I'll put a plug for the VBU. It's a virtual bariatric university that is being set up from Mohawk Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center. It's a weekly session that's gonna be every Monday. We're gonna address various topics. And next week, at the same time, we'll be looking at what is called a long tube gastric bypass. Some call it a diverted MGB. Some call it a gastric bypass for a long BP limb and a long tube. Hopefully by bringing that to light and discussion, uh, we would uh, give one more operation to surgeons to put in the armamentarium. And then we're going to find out that there are going to be cases where we might end up doing a procedure in a patient in whom there might have been a contraindication. For instance, right now we say hiatal hernia and reflux is a contraindication for all patients with uh, MGB. Now, we have shown that patients with MGB with reflux, we treat them with a long tube gastric bypass or a diverted MGB. Well, why can't we just do that in the beginning? That is the question. And that will be the discussion for next week. Thank you all. Thank you, Himanshu on the video team. Thank and we'll you. see you. Oh, we'll see. Dr. You. Dr. Bobby, wish you a very happy birthday. Yeah, we should you happy Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Mel. Thank you very much for including me. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. We're honored to be and yeah. keep up the good work. Namaste. <laughs>